Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Go Beyond Incident Response – The Benefits of a Complete Incident Management Platform. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface. We will be answering them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Jim. Thanks, Carol. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and thanks again for joining us. Uh, once again, my name is Jim Flaging, and I'll be your host today. Um, and today's session is presented by D3 Security, SANS Institute, and my firm, the Chertoff Group. Now, for those of you who don't know the Chertoff Group, our team has deep security experience at the highest levels of government. And from that perspective, like you, we've realized that security, cyber in particular, is fast becoming a top business and national security issue. And today, we work closely with CISOs and boards to help them better understand risk and then develop plans to enhance their resiliency to those risks. We also work with innovators and policymakers to help them better understand markets and make decisions. And over the past year, we've heard consistent pressing needs from defenders, those of you in security and IT operations. You've told us things like, hey, we want to get away from whack-a-mole. We want better coordination across the tools that we already have. And we need to better leverage the collective talents across our IT and security teams. And then finally, we need better information to communicate risk to our boards and senior management. And today's session is focused on these issues. So let's begin. The key focused areas for today, uh, there's five, and let's go ahead and get into them. First, to set the stage, we're going to take a look at something that I call the three T's of the digital economy. This lens of the three T's, it's been very effective in getting execs and boards to feel more comfortable engaging in security. Then second, we're going to look at some of the implications of the three T's, namely the need for agile threat and incident response. And as you know, this is hard, especially in light of limited, difficult to find staff. Then third, we're going to discuss current approaches and trends in incident response. Fourth, we're going to dive into some of the key capabilities that distinguish incident management from incident response. And then finally, of course, we're going to have time for audience questions and discussions. And on that note, if you want to ask a question, just submit one through this handy GoToWebinar portal, and we'll do our best to address these to the panelists. So without further ado, let's go ahead and meet each of our presenters. Uh, you've heard enough from me. So guys, if you can each take a minute to introduce yourselves, and let's go with the flow that's on the page. So Bob, let's start with you, pass it to Chris, and then Fraser, you bring it home. Bob? Hi, good, hi, good afternoon. I say Bob Day, a retired Rear Admiral from the United States Coast Guard. Uh, spent five years as a CIO and uh, Cyber Commander. We're building Cyber Command from ground zero. Since then, I've been uh, consulting uh, specifically in the cybersecurity area. Um, with the Chertoff Group, as well as uh, being the uh, executive uh, director of the uh, Virginia Commonwealth of Virginia Cyber Commission for Governor McAuliffe. Chris, pass it to you. Hello, Chris Crowley, uh, currently a SANS instructor, work as a, a contractor for U.S. Department of Defense, formerly U.S. Department of Energy. I've uh, worked in uh, financial industry, worked with power grid companies, worked in education. Um, my focus currently is really a class that I um, wrote over the last uh, year and a half. It's called Security Operations uh, Management 517. Um, I try to assist organizations to do um, response much better than they're doing currently. So I'm uh, happy to um, join these uh, gentlemen today in order to uh, discuss that and hopefully provide some insight to the attendees. Hi guys, this is uh, Fraser Ritalik from D3 Security. Uh, I'm the Director of Solutions Engineering here at D3. 
Uh, I've been with D3 a while now, 12 years in a variety of roles. I've kind of hopped back and forth actually a couple times from uh, the product management team uh, to the implementation team. Um, I have a lot of hands-on experience uh, deploying incident management solutions in the field, uh, and that covers a lot of different vertical markets, the finance sector, uh, the utility sector, healthcare, uh, a lot of highly regulated spaces. Uh, and I hope to bring that perspective to uh, today's webinar. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Um, let's go ahead and, and move forward. And to set the stage, I'd like to talk about something I call the three T's of the digital economy. And some of what I've learned sitting on boards and advising on boards is they focus on many issues, but three stand out. Boards focus on risk management, value creation, and of course, metrics. And a key question that now comes up in board meetings is how do we grow safely, but without sacrificing our firm's security or our stakeholders' privacy? And I think answering this question is a heck of a lot easier through this lens of the three T's of the digital economy, and that's technology, threat, and trust. Now, why is that? Well, these are three big interrelated ideas that have a profound impact on strategy, on policy, and on public opinion. And thanks to the impact of profound technology disruptions that we're all living through and managing, things like mobility and cloud and social and big data and IoT, every organization can and probably must redefine how they're delivering goods and services, how you're interacting with your customers and partners, and in some cases, heck, do we still have a valid business model? I mean, consider, do you want to be Netflix or Blockbuster? But this golden age that we live in, it's got a dark side. You know, it's enabled a new class of bad guys that's emerged, and these, they're taking advantage of holes in these technology platforms because we know that in many cases, security has been bolted on, not built it in. And these risks are taking the form of cyber threats and often from highly organized gangs and nation states. Well, these breaches, well, they're having the effect, the cumulative effect of eroding trust. Trust consumers have in business. Trust citizens and business have in government. And these days, it doesn't seem government trusts anybody, even itself. <laughs> it's serious. It's sad, because we all know how important trust is to any relationship. So back to that question that boards want answered. How do we grow without sacrificing privacy and security? Well, it seems to me the winners are going to be those that leverage that first T, technology, to lower costs and deliver better goods and services. It's going to be those who best react to that second T threat and demonstrate that they value trust, that third T, and that they have commitment, top-down commitment, systems and management process that actually delivers on these values. So in the context of today's discussion, let's go ahead and double-click on this second T, and that's threat. Now, it's a little bit of a busy slide, but let's start in the upper left-hand corner to sort of better understand the threat dynamics. As many of you know, threat actors can be grouped into four categories, individuals and lone wolves, activists, and increasingly criminal gangs and nation states. And isn't it strange that cybersecurity is the only major threat vector that we expect individual firms, small firms, who could be attacked by nations and yet still be responsible for defense? Now, that's a tough fight. Now, second, how do these bad actors get in? Many ways. It's things you buy, your supply chain, groups you partner with, things, but it's also things that we can control. Maybe it's weak controls, like passwords. It's poor monitoring, poor response plans, and incomplete or ineffective management process. And third and finally, as we know, some of the toughest threats come from the inside. A disgruntled employee, anybody from the server room to the boardroom, can inflict serious damage. And many times this traces back to things as simple as education, cyber hygiene. Don't click on that link. Now, in wrapping up this intro to our audience, I hope this approach of the three T's might be helpful for you as you discuss risk your response plans, and your budget needs with senior management. So with that as an intro, 
I'd like to turn it over to Bob, who spent the better part of his career actually dealing with this in leading large IT organizations. And Bob, just I know you've got some really good thoughts, but I'd love to hear just what's your perspective on some of these trends as you've seen it and lived it. Well, it's just amazing, Jim, the pace of the change and that these uh, trends are just having rapid changes in a lot of areas. Specifically, you kind of pointed out to it, we now have a whole new group of stakeholders who maybe three years ago really couldn't even spell cybersecurity, but now they have this new high-level focus on everything cybersecurity, particularly because of that trust issue. Boardrooms, executive suites, our investors, our regulators, they're all now focused on how we're managing this cyber risk. And this is having a corresponding impact on those CIOs, CISOs, not only that, all the way down into the IT and security organizations. Secondly, the other piece that I'm seeing is the nature of IT and security operations. You know, the art of defending against these threats is also rapidly changing. I mean, just four or five years ago, we were thinking, you know, control the perimeter, everything's good. You know, a couple of tools here, that's fine. But they're proving ineffective. And the nature, the changing nature of these threat vectors are requiring all of us, and particularly the clients that we work with, to really evaluate their overall security posture just through the, the entirety of their IT ecosystem and really start focusing on revamping processes across both their IT and security teams to really get to this one piece that's really become the most important part. How do you get that speed and the effectiveness to be able to respond to the threats, ones that are already in your environment and those that are going to come in here fairly soon? So that's just one significant area that uh, we're just starting to see. Moving on from that, you know, really, uh, if we go to the next slide, a challenge that has come because of this escalation and this new um, level of interest and uh, insight is we're seeing this massive demand for cybersecurity professionals, those people that have deep technical expertise to implement not only the security products that we're having there, but be able to understand our networks and identify, prevent, and respond to those threats. This is probably the most challenging area for many of our organizations and probably for many of our listeners out there. If you just take a quick look at the slide, you can just see the demand that we're going to require. A million person shortfall right now expected to grow up to 1.5 million in 2019. You know, show me an unemployed uh, cybersecurity professional, particularly in the DC area, and as I'm trying to build a new security operations center there, I've interviewed over 50 people just in the last week, and only two are really truly qualified. This demand is just going to continue to grow, and uh, I saw that through the Virginia Cybersecurity Commission, as well as the clients that we deal with. Our education programs, they're just not keeping up with the demand for the cybersecurity professionals. And I say, not only that, we're not interesting getting these kids uh, particularly at an early age in those STEM majors to take an interest in um, cybersecurity. And you see that a Raytheon uh, you know, survey said basically most of them have never considered a career in cybersecurity. So the demand is going off the chart, and yet the supply to be able to deliver trained professionals is just not there. That We're doing everything we can to move it faster, and, uh, but it's, it's just not going to keep up. And this is what we're hearing. We're hearing that this workforce shortage is their number one problem. And I'm certainly seeing that uh, as I try and build a, a cyber operations center. Hey, Bob. Uh, this, yeah, go ahead. Um, other than the fact that I bet you're going to get a few applicants after today, <laughs> um, so what are the options? I mean, what are the options that you're facing right now and just organizations in general? I mean, what are the options to solve this gap and the associated costs? So the options that you're seeing right now are people are going out and hiring consulting firms and those capabilities, and because of demand, they're paying top dollar for it. The other piece is, the other way to solve the problem is, you've alluded to already, is that the technology side of this equation is changing. More and more people are going to cloud. Some of the legacy IT functions that were in those organizations, running server farms and those types of things, we need to look at taking and leveraging them, training them internally, 
and moving them into a security focused environment where they have an understanding of both but also now starting to take and leverage their capabilities versus starting ground zero and getting them into a more security focused type of performance and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, but really the problem is is we got a cost piece um, and you're trying to buy it and consulting and bring that in uh, and particularly just the cost for remediation when you're calling a team in after an incident has happened you know, is say open your wallet and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you to bring those types of teams in. So that's really uh, an area that uh, people are starting to look at is how do you revamp your IT operations and uh, work with that. Hey so, Bob. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Before you jump into convergence, we have a, a question from the audience, and thank you, Spencer, for this. And the question was, well, why the heck don't we get current IT people interested in IT in security to do cross training? What can you offer on that, Bob? Well, that's a perfect lead-in um, to uh, my next topic of conversation. And we've done surveys from the Chertoff group, and I'm certainly seeing this in the organizations that I'm going into, and that's exactly what is happening. We're starting to see a convergence of the IT and security operations um, you know, that is occurring because of not only the demand um, for the security professionals, but the fact lack that we have them and the cost related to that. So traditionally, your organizations, you know, the, uh, particularly the IT and the security teams, they've kind of operated in separate tracking. You know, one was to oversee and take that security information, throw some stuff back over the fence to the IT um, operations teams, patch this, get this done. But what we're seeing is now they're moving away from this stovepipe type of approach and kind of merging together and having this convergence where the IT personnel, particularly as we start transitioning into the newer technologies where they're not being what we used to call server huggers, now moving them up the chain, exposing them, so in many cases, as you say, on-the-job training, um, along with some of you know curriculums out there that you can get um, through th institutes like SANS or even some local community colleges with certification programs, is starting to have this collaborative approach. And it's not only good to help uh, you know, really stop this gap of personnel that we have, but we're finding that for a highly effective organization um, to be able to thwart the threats that we're facing, that we need a collaborative and coordinated approach not only just for day-to-day -day operations, but specifically when we look at incident response. If you're not being able to do that converged approach, um, you're really going to lose some effectiveness. The first is, as I say, the converged approach takes and helps the shortage of cybersecurity professionals and to be able to take and move these guys up the left. And as you can see from the quote on the top left there, IT operations are becoming increasingly responsible for managing the security tools that not only harden the infrastructure, but provide the security team with the insight into the overall, really, security status of the environment. More importantly, to provide those indicators of malicious activity where those deep security analysts and those deep security professionals are able to take that information and move it forward. The other part is, is the sheer volume of the security event information that's being processed by today's organizations really requires those, you know, this new converged organization to finally, you know, tune those security tools because they're just being overwhelmed um, with the amount of security events that are coming out there to be able to really generate meaningful information. And that requires participation by everybody. It also requires the ability to rapidly identify, determine the root cause of, and eliminate these recurring security incidents that we see that are causing part of that noise and really distract the security personnel from identifying more urgent threats. And then follow on with that, with the current threat landscape, we've really got to get that speed to detect, respond, and remediate is the key success factor for any cyber incident. And that really involves all the groups, security operations, IT operations, and particularly that well, you know, well-practiced, well-documented uh, incident response plan. And that's where having well-defined processes between all of the elements in this converged organization, the versatile analytics that you need on top of that, and particularly those practice cyber incident response playbooks sort of in a system of record that everybody's looking towards 
these are going to be the key enablers to really reduce that time to respond and remediate. And the organizations where that's being done, where I see the best practices are the ones that actually tabletop that on a regular basis, even though they may not have an incident at hand, they really move forward and uh, you know practice this on a regular basis using that well-defined cyber response playbooks and those processes that they're going to use. Hmm. So, hey, Bob, uh, thanks. thanks. This is a really good discussion. Um, you talked about the importance of testing. It's probably pretty hard for people who are just keeping up with the day-to-day. -day. Um, what are some of the essentials that go into a good test, and what can organizations do to get themselves ready for that kind of testing environment? Well, I've certainly heard that, well, we're too busy to test. We, we're too busy to take the time out to do that. But I'm telling you, that investment's probably well worth it. Um, some of the key elements is really being able to take a threat vector scenario and work it from top to bottom. And this means all the way through the IT operations, who's the roles, what's the responsibilities, and having particularly that mechanism where everybody's looking to that playbook, that place where they're going to put the information such that then we're seeing what is the response from the overall organization that then becomes also feeds back up into those people, those stakeholders who have an interest. How quickly are we responding? How effectively are we responding? So it results, you know, there's multiple ways of doing it, but really, you know, my belief is, is the focus is, is take multiple different scenarios and be able to run a playbook off of all of those and exercise it, be it an insider threat, be it actual malware, be it ransomware, um, being it threats to your vertical specific industry that are known or they're out there and running those scenarios on a routine basis such that you practice but then day-to-day -day operations you run as you practice each and every time. Those are really okay. key to me. All right. Hey, Bob, that's fantastic. And I have a final question to you or any of the other panelists before we pass it to Chris. And um, this question came from, I may mispronounce your name, G2 Das. Um, and it's a question around patching. And it said, hey, we're living with a huge challenge around patching vulnerabilities, and it's taking us 10 to 15 days to do that because of the size of their infrastructure. What can we do to protect our network in that period, that 10 to 15 days when we're doing our patching? Let me open that up to any of the panelists. This is, uh, this is Chris. I want to I wanna start with one thing on that. I'll introduce it really quickly. And it's a fairly simple thing, even though it's difficult to get there, but it will address it. Um, application whitelisting. Make it so that the things that are authorized may run. The things which are not authorized will not run. Now, that's not going to save you in all cases, but what you're going to get is some added protect, protection in terms of preventing the adversary from being able to move forward in their objectives, and then what you're going to do is a very high value detect of the fact that some computer was trying to run something that was unauthorized. Again, it's not going to stop them from accomplishing their ultimate objective unless you intervene, but it puts you in a fabulous position to know that you need to intervene and then initiate that response action. And this is Bob. And I say first, my first response is is I congratulate you for patching. And even though that you're having um, you know those downtime periods up to 15 days, maybe uh, even further, the fact that you have a you know a standardized patch plan and are actually doing that, you are taking care of one of the basic fundamental of the ecosystem and probably the best bang for your buck initially um, to be able to prevent from some many of these things. So many of the organizations that we're going into. Their patch cycles are much, much longer. Um, and as I say, it is a heavy lift, but it is one of the core elements um, in the overall uh, defense of your entire ecosystem. You know, whatever we can do to be able to speed that up. Um, but then again, we're at the whim of many of the vendors in terms of when they throw their patches at us. Um, but the fact that you're doing it, um, you are practicing one of the best efforts. I understand. It's frustrating, and it does leave holes at times. Thanks, guys. For the sake of time here, let's go ahead and, uh, Chris, move to you. Bob, I've got a couple more questions for you, but maybe we'll save those to the end. Um, but we do have a, a good list of questions coming in from our audience. So, Chris, over to you. 
Yeah, what I want to talk about a little bit is here is sort of my vision of what it is to perform security operations. Um, there are a number of different functions that I want to address, discuss each of them briefly. Um, I can elaborate on these at length, but I just want to make sure that everybody understands what it means to actually perform security operations. Um, large organizations are going to have um, discrete um, entities which actually perform these separate functions. Smaller and medium-sized organizations are probably going to have people wearing various hats in order to do these things, but nonetheless you need to do all of these things. The first one is the notion of a command center. This is the idea of having a place that can be called, it's kind of like a 911, um, you know, I need help coming from the organization. Who are we going to call? And then that command center maintains situational awareness of the information systems for the organization and is able to direct responsive action. It's also able to direct action in order to investigate the situation, see what's going on, make a determination if there is a problem. And that is done in conjunction with the network security monitoring team. This network security monitoring team maintains awareness of the information systems for the organization and their primary objective is the rapid and accurate detection of issues within the organization. Our ability to detect issues is terrible as a worldwide defensive posture of organizations. There's data out there that shows that we don't detect it ourselves. We are told by third-party entities after there's a problem. That's not okay. You can't hope to intervene and interrupt an adversary from affecting your organization if you don't know that there's a problem going on. And that's what we need network security monitoring to do. Additionally, we want threat intelligence. And this is taking information either from the outside that people have collected and then given to us or that we actually are developing inside of our organization in order to understand how it is that our adversaries are threatening us. If we do not understand those threats, we will not be able to cost-effectively deploy defenses in order to be able to manage the issues that we are encountering today. If you're not aware of the threat, you are going to waste your effort. You're going to waste your scarce resources in attempting to deploy defenses. The next notion here in terms of a functional capability is that of incident response. Incident response is necessary. We need to be able to mobilize resources to engage adversary action in order to be able to thwart that action. This incident response additionally needs to understand what it is that it, it is attempting to defend. If I send somebody out to a place to try to work with those information systems and they don't understand that those information systems can't be shut down because it'll cause damage to some sort of physical entity under the control of that information system, that's a real problem for us. That would cause more damage in the attempt to help. And we just simply don't want that. We can't have that. As Bob was mentioning, we need to have practice. I think that incident response needs to be drilling all the time and utilizing the information coming from network security monitoring and from our threat intelligence in order to direct what things are most likely to occur and also practice some edge case scenarios so that if something like that happens, they aren't seeing it for the first time under uh, live fire, if you, if you will. The idea of forensics is a, a capability which supports the responsive action, which gives us granular and detailed information about the circumstances of what we're seeing. We need to have first responders with the capability of saying, hey, I see this, but I need somebody else to answer some really detailed questions for me. And frequently organizations will do this in an outsourced fashion because uh, you know they can't afford to have forensics teams on staff all the time, but larger organizations certainly will have this capability inside, and particularly organizations that have sensitivity about the data that they might be uh, processing will have this forensic capability inside of the organization. The, uh, the next notion of um, security operations is something that I call self-assessment. This is a large container, but it's a critically important thing. 
we just were briefly talking about patching, but another thing related to this, and it's something that is a tremendously powerful defensive attribute of an organization, is change detection. If something changes in your information systems, you should know about that, and you should be able to authorize change before it's deployed, and then monitor for unauthorized changes, as well as detecting when there is a change in an information system, because that is typical within adversary behavior. Self-assessment includes vulnerability scanning in order to identify known flaws that are present in systems. And then the next step from that is the notion of penetration testing. Penetration testing is, okay, let's identify vulnerabilities and then see what would happen if I actively exploited that vulnerability. Self-assessment includes red teaming, which is, okay, now we're going to take that pen test and make it go against an active defense in order to model what the threat would look like so that our defense can see if they could actually detect it. And finally is the notion of uh, business alignment. If your security operations do not understand how the business makes money, if they do not understand the information systems that are in, uh, in play, if they do not understand where the business is going, new acquisitions, this is going to be a failed security operations entity. And what we want to have is a bi-directional communication between security operations and the business in order to understand what's coming up in the future as well as to understand what failures have we had and how might we need to adjust how we do things in order to be able to move forward with our security posture. Great, so let me give you one quick example. And this is a uh, this is something that is out there and I'm talking about Drydex as exemplary for a large number of uh, crimeware families that are attacking organizations. And the typical scenario here is Drydex with a phishing email getting in, dropping um, a word macro via a real seeming um, attachment that will do things like um, actively evade sandbox and anti-reverse um, anti engineering techniques, things like let me check to see if there were a certain number of, of Word documents in the, recent in the recent files, and if there aren't, I'm not going to do anything. The, uh, the Drydex then participates in a command and control channel, steals credentials, and then attempts to conduct financial theft. And Drydex, what it was doing was actually because the crypto locking ransomware was so effective, they started dropping a crypto locking ransomware as well. So the question becomes, if this is common in the environment, can you respond to this? We know this is happening. Right? So let me just mention a few things that you should be able to do in the face of this. Because this is how attackers are making money today. First of all, I want you to think about the fact that all of your preventive controls will at some point be bypassed. Plan for it. It's a fact. You can detect the initial phishing. And someone's going to fall for it, but you know what? Someone else in your organization is going to detect it. Train those users to report it and have the capability to investigate when one of your users detects it. I want you to be able to detect command and control. This sounds difficult, but there are certain characteristics of the command and control channel that you can address. The servers themselves, weird ports, odd certificates in use for encrypted communication, and the fact that they typically use new domains. If you're looking for all the new domains on any given day, you would find command and control. Finally, looking for execution on the endpoint. As an example, Sysmon is a great way to look for executables that run without stopping them, but that you've never seen before in your organization. This is built into Windows. It would be relatively easy to deploy. And then you need to be able to take this information and respond to it. This is what modern security operations looks like. Chris, thanks a lot. That was a really good tutorial on that. And I personally love the focus up front on the detection aspect, the ability to detect change. And in particular, I was really intrigued with the notion of the steering committee. And, um, you know, from my own perspective of 
you know, sitting on boards and talking with them. I, I would certainly advise IT and security executives to do some simple things. Go have lunch with your business unit leaders. Find out and be sure you know how are we making money, what are the most important data assets that we have, and let's make sure that we're prioritizing our incident response capabilities around that. And that kind of leads me to a question that we got from um, Mr. Anthony Bronson um, out of the great state of Tennessee here, who Bob was commenting on a point you had made about how, what are examples, what do you mean by pre-built playbooks to help in this process? So let me open that up to any of the panelists to take that question. Can I just start and then I'll uh, let the other folks go? I just want to say, take this scenario that I just described and talk about every single thing that you would do given the scenario. Know who you're going to call. Know who's going to act. That's a playbook. And I can maybe uh, jump in and, and, and add to that a little bit. This is Fraser from D3. Um, you know, a, a playbook entails several steps. There's a lot of different frameworks out there that, that kind of uh, sum up how organizations are, are you know, supposed to respond to incidents and the best steps to take from, um, you know, the initial assessment, triage, you know, determining whether or not you have a false positive on your hands and, and then if an incident is legitimized, you know, the various steps that you take. Um, as Chris said, who needs to be notified, um, you know, which, which logs you need to review, you need to close a port, you need to take, uh, you know, a, a host temporarily off your network. Um, all those detailed steps uh, need to be mapped out ahead of time. You need to think ahead of time, prepare for these incidents so that when one of these comes up, you can execute effectively. Now, as a solutions provider, you know, we definitely play a, a role in, in enabling and empowering uh, the execution of these incident response plans. Um, and that might start by having the, the you know, folks in the command and control center, um, sorry, pardon me, the, uh, the, the incident command center have, uh, have oversight and, and the ability to delegate tasks out to the various team members, um, you know, whether that be uh, the folks in IT support um, or, um, you know, their, their forensics investigators after the incident has concluded. They, they, they basically, we can provide them with, with tools that facilitate that whole process and part of that is working in a, in a framework where not all of your incident responders, not all of your analysts uh, are veterans. Not all these folks have been doing this for, for 10, 5, or even necessarily one year. Um, you know, if you have an incident that gets detected um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, 2 a.m. On a, on a Saturday, um, it, it's very possible that someone who may have moved over from the IT team and, and doesn't have that, that wealth of knowledge, that depth of experience, might be the point person um, on doing the triage for this particular event. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's our responsibility in the solutions provider space to create uh, a, a workspace where those people can succeed, to provide them with the ability to, to plan and to lay out response playbooks that can be executed on um, by someone who maybe isn't the most senior analyst. And for them to be able to assess what's going on, analyze the events, um, and take the initial steps, um, it might include, you know, waking up a more senior person out of bed. Um, but when, when we talk about playbooks, it's, it's really kind of laying out a, a manageable process um, that may involve some automation and just bringing together those different teams that, uh, you know, Chris had, had laid out on his other slides there to collaborate and facilitate an effective um, organization-wide response. And if that means escalating things up to, you know, a, a managerial level, then, then we need to make sure that, that those steps are involved as well. Yeah, Fraser, and this is Bob, and as I say, I can, I can hear the groans and the sighs out there in the organization. It's like, well, that's really, really hard to do. Well, yeah, it is, but guess what? There are best practices out there that are well documented. There are playbooks that are, you know, particularly being laid out there by regulatory authorities if you're happily to be in one of those um, heavily regulated industries of where reporting needs to go, what needs to be reported, those types of things. And having those predefined and bringing it into a potentially a less mature organization, they automatically get to take the best of breeds out there and be able to map off of those and those are you know so it's not you don't have to invent all of it in most cases you can take best practices whether it's coming out of uh, national standards or specific industry ones where industry other industry personnel have already developed them through either one of the ISACs or one of the other information sharing bodies out there so I you know I hear the, the groan that's really hard to do 
Yes, it is, but in many cases, some of that's already available to you through providers like D3. Hey, guys, one last question before we turn to Fraser, and uh, this is from a place that I'd like to be right now, sunny Australia and Maximilian Jeffries. And the question is a good one here is, how do you develop these playbooks if you are an incident response team that's external to the business, a third-party service provider, and in this case, lots of unique bespoke systems, so it's not something you can just sort of buy off the shelf? This is, uh, this is Chris. I can start and then um, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, if you're brought in as a uh, third party in order to be able to do incident response, I would think that part of the thing that you're doing with them is drilling on these bespoke systems. If I were to run incident response, and actually I, I managed an incident response team for a number of years, um, in a large nationwide government network with um, tens of thousands of endpoints that we controlled and at least 100,000 other endpoints that we didn't. And we had scenarios around all the things that we knew that we had to deal with and we had specific techniques for dealing with things that were connected to our network that we had never seen before. So you have to do your best guess, but also this is particularly important for you to drive it home, the importance of it, with your customer. We need your help to help you. Fraser, let's pass the ball over to you. I'm anxious to hear your section, and in particular, I'd, like, I'd personally like to know what the heck's the difference between incident response and incident management? Yeah, thanks, Jim. I think uh, maybe I'll just tackle that here uh, right off the bat. So, you know, incident response, um, in, in, in our vernacular at least, is, uh, is basically the concept of, of you have a detected event and, and you know, you're going to respond to that in a, in a reactive way. And that response is critical. You want to limit the damage that gets done. You want to limit the, the access that these, these bad actors have to your network. Um, but at least over here at D3, we're, we're strong advocates for um, kind of a more cyclical approach. And, and what I mean by that is um, rather than, you know, being reactive, and uh, we're going to get to, you know, a, a pretty strong analogy to that in a second, um, you, you want to be proactive. You want to plan and, and you want to analyze your, your uh, incident response activities and the incidents that you're really seeing um, coming in through your SIM, um, you know, how successful are phishing attacks being, you know, do your staff know not to click on these links, stuff like that. You, you want to analyze your, your incident data um, and, and really cycle that back into your, your planning phase and allocate your scarce budget and, and resources most effectively to reduce your incident volume, to prevent some of these incidents that are reoccurring on a regular basis from happening, um, to tune your SIM rules better so you get less false positives. There's all kinds of different ways that we can um, you know, take a more holistic approach to incident management as opposed to being reactive, and that's something that, that you know, we wanted to focus on uh, with you guys here today. Um, just to segue into my, my slides here, I think that uh, you know, what we have on screen is, is this kind of representation of some of the different teams and tools that we have at our disposal. Um, you know, we all know from what our, our present, uh, presenters have said here already that you know, we are going to have bad actors that, that do manage to penetrate our defenses. Um, you know, people are going to click on links they should. Uh, one way or another, you know, malicious code might find um, our way on their, its way onto our network. Um, and uh, what we really see as, as, a, as a critical element to taking the best stance to, to, to combat and counteract these uh, bad actors um, is a need for coordination. And, uh, you know, we see, unfortunately, a lack of coordination sometimes between these teams. And, and it's not just within the cybersecurity team. It's also, you know, coordination with other departments. Uh, like your traditional IT support team, um, like sometimes your legal team, your compliance department. And so my slides are going to focus really on how to achieve this type of coordination. Um, and, you know, what we see out there in the marketplace right now is a lot of organizations still using very kind of rudimentary tools, stuff like email and Excel and, and, and file shares as their primary um, tools for, for achieving this kind of interdepartmental, interteam coordination. And we think that there's a better way to do things. Uh, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the next slide uh, 
I want to, to talk to you guys about here. Um, this is the analogy we kind of take to to represent uh, incident management versus incident response. And, and you know, everyone's probably familiar with the game whack-a-mole. Um, you know, as a defender of your backyard lawn, you watch for moles to pop out of the ground, and and you try and fight back by whacking them back into their holes. And you know, it's a brave fight, but uh, you never seem to get ahead of the problem. And eventually, you know, your arm gets tired, or your concentration slips, and one of these little guys is, is going to get away, get away. And if you stop for a moment to analyze your mistake, then, uh, well, a whole bunch more of these guys are going to get past you. So, you know, I, I imagine the analogy for, you know, our, our day-to-day cybersecurity operations is coming through pretty loud and clear here. Um, you can, you know, react and, and, and respond effectively to a lot of these moles, so to speak, um, by being reactive. Um, but you'll never get to all of them unless you can somehow um, you know, predict their behavior and, and try and get ahead of the problem a little bit. Now, this is obviously a, you know, it's just a kid's game, it's just an analogy, but uh, we do see the same challenge playing out in many major corporations across America. It's not just small and medium-sized businesses that are having these problems, even you know, some of the largest organizations out there um, hey, are, are struggling to keep up with the volume of, of incidents and events they're seeing, and, and so they're not being disciplined in investing the time to um, to do that plan, to do those tabletop exercises, uh, and to really facilitate um, an effective response by doing things like root cause analysis. Um, hey, Fraser. Yes, I, I love the analogy. And this, I know when we were doing our prep, Bob, you had a couple of colorful stories in this kind of real life examples. Do you can is there any one of those you can share for the audience today? Well, sure. I mean, I, I, if I go back to you know one of the significant ones in my CIO role is the uh, 2014 heart bleed, and uh, you know we just did not have a systematic way of going about identifying where this vulnerability existed. It seemed like one place where we knocked it out, we overlooked four other. There was just not a systematic way to be able to take my entire IT operations in my. Uh, security forces and bring them together and have them focus on one area such that we were clearly covering the entire IT infrastructure looking for this very serious um, threat vector. And, I mean, we managed it on an Excel spreadsheet and it was just ineffective. Thanks, Bob. Frazier, back over to you. Yeah, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so. You know, several years ago, we, we were taking a look at the, uh, the the kind of current state of cybersecurity operations, and uh, you know, we, we noticed what we thought were some significant gaps um, that weren't really effectively being addressed by organizations. Um, you know, despite all the, the great tools that are out there for, for detection and um, and and control of our network, um, a lot of this, these these items you see on screen here weren't really being addressed uh, effectively by most organizations. Um, and some of these things are, you know, completely unique to the cybersecurity field. Um, you know, things like false positive metrics and instant response playbooks, or, or you know, automatic correlation of threat intelligence. Um, this is pretty core stuff to cybersecurity teams. But there's also other elements to the operation that um, are, are really shared across multiple different departments. Stuff like trend analysis. You know, giving visibility to those decision makers into what's happening um, at a cybersecurity operational level. Um, now. In, in our experience, this remains a, a pretty significant need for most organizations today, uh, and and we think that they really need to take a more proactive approach to addressing these purposefully and strategically. Um, and there are solutions out there that can do this effectively. Um, so, this particular slide here, and uh, I believe there's an animation if you want to just cue that. Perfect. There we go. Yeah. So, basically, um, through technology, through software platforms, we can enable. Uh, collaboration and correlation between uh, these different entities, um, and you know the concept of incident management. Uh, it really touches all different elements of the cybersecurity team, from threat hunters to the incident responders to those who operate the sim, and and uh, it also crosses those departmental boundaries you know, involving uh, IT support, as we said before, legal compliance, risk, etc. Um, all these people and all these tools need to be coordinated and collaborative in order to execute effective incident management. Um, and it's important to, you know, have kind of a, an information backbone and, and, and tools that allow you to, to delegate tasks, to assign uh, responsibility, to notify people under the appropriate circumstances, and to really model and plan for an effective response playbook, um, which is so critical to, to, you know, minimizing the damage uh, when an incident takes place. So, 
basically what we're saying here is that if, if your organization is, is using spreadsheets and email and file share for this purpose, um, you're falling short of the mark. And, and organizations need to, to, to give this another look and, and be more proactive in their, in their systematic approach. So I think the next slide uh, is going to cover um, basically an example. It's a case study, and this is a project that, that I, I was personally involved with uh, back in 2016. Um, this is a Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 banking company, by the way. Um, and, and basically, this slide, we just wanted to give you guys a kind of a feel without actually identifying who these guys were. Um, they're a pretty big player, and, and, and they're an international bank, um, and they have a fairly sizable cybersecurity team that's siloed up into different roles. Um, They've invested heavily in, into staff as much as they can hire qualified people, and they have some pretty nice tools in their tech stack as well. Um, but what you'll notice uh, on this particular slide is that uh, among those tools, you know, they, they aren't really using a, a sophisticated tool for incident management. Um, you know, they're still using email, they're still using file share and spreadsheets, and these are tools which, which fail to really provide the, the adequate structure, the standardization, the metrics reporting, the ability to, to notify, delegate tasks. Um, and do all the critical elements of, of executing an actual incident response. Um, you know, spreadsheets, uh, incident responders, and, and cybersecurity professionals are very intelligent people, and they they, they like tools like spreadsheets that are open-ended. But uh, at the end of the day, um, they're just not structured enough and don't have that that intelligence and those automated processes built in that can really help uh, organizations get to the next level. Hmm. Hey, Fraser, how many of those incident response people were IT operations, or were those all security operations? Um, I think a, a large number of them were, were promoted from the IT support space. Um, basically, you know, I think these guys were, were dealing with the, the same problems as everyone else, and, and, you know, there were some members of the team that we were dealing with, the senior kind of level three analysts who were um, quite experienced and had been doing it for five, ten years, some of them. Um, but probably 10, 12 of these guys had come from the IT sports space and they were, you know, learning on the job, they were being trained and they were, they were doing a good job, um, but we had to come in and, and, and help them be effective. And that's really the value of, of you know, providing a, a, a workspace and tools that can kind of simplify the process and, and guide the end user through um, an effective response based on what we've planned in our playbooks. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it really does to me, it feels like it emphasizes the need for playbooks and getting to the root cause to help these folks, you know, do this cross training and, and sort of move to both sides of the aisle, so to speak. Okay, Absolutely. great. Do you have um Do you have any other examples here that you want to cover? Well, just uh, a little bit more information on this on this uh, one um, bank that we worked with. So essentially, they they came to us with a set of pain points. Um, you know, they felt that their the organization was was you know responding effectively in a reactive way, um, but that really their teams weren't working effectively together. Um, you know their their threat intelligence team was um, rapidly going through the different threat intelligence resources out there, um, but it was difficult to effectively communicate and, and and make all the other teams aware of threats that might impact the organization. Their management team in particular. Um, was having symptoms of, of lack of transparency, lack of visibility into a comprehensive picture of what was happening uh, at the cybersecurity operational level. Simple stuff like um, incident frequencies and volumes. How many phishing attacks are we seeing and what percentage of those are being successful? Do we need to invest money into uh, additional training programs for our staff to, to kind of help um, prevent these, these phishing attacks from being affected? Is that going to be a positive ROI investment for the bank when we compare it with the risk of not doing so? So that was really the driving force behind uh, this particular institution kind of coming to us and, and working with us to implement a solution. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the net benefit was that we helped them be more strategic in how they, they align their resources with the problems that they were seeing on the ground. Hmm. Good stuff. So I want to come back to the panelists with a question. So this is my question. <laughs> um, boards care about three things, boards and senior management, risk, risk management, value creation, and metrics. What do I take from this discussion that's going to help me if I'm the CFO or the CEO or senior management? Like, why does this approach matter to me? Anybody want to tackle that one? I can jump in and, and, and give it a shot, and then I'll, I'll leave some time definitely for the other guys to, to talk about their experience. But I think that uh, 
I think that the major answer there is risk. Um, and you know whether that's brand and reputational risk, whether it's risk of, of actual financial loss. Um, you know I think we're all quite familiar with the fact that the stakes are very, very high, um, and you have these bad actors out there that um, are, are looking to compromise your systems. And, and if you, you know, don't take a strategic approach and, and leverage all of the resources that are available to you, if you don't have an effective way of, of making your uh, IT support staff into effective incident responders. Um, then, then you're exposing yourself. You're exposing the company, and you're exposing, you know, the, the shareholders' value in, in your organization. So, um, risk is, is is the answer, in my opinion. This is Bob, and I'll add to that. Yes, it's risk driven, but now if you have documented, you know, response plans, and that you know you have a proven system of record by which you're going to respond to those threats to mitigate the risk. That gives senior management, it gives regulators, it gives even the insurance industry from cyber insurance the tools and the, that you have in hand that you actually have a thought out strategic plan with implementable capabilities that takes the best reasonable approach to mitigate those risks. Those are the tool sets that prove it. A spreadsheet's not going to do it, but having that you've actually thought every of these scenarios out based on the risk. Uh, that's related to your industry, um, to what the data that you're trying to protect, and having that in a, you know, say basically a system of record of form that you exercise against and that you use in your day-to-day -day operations to coordinate the disparate, uh, you know, work that's being done by these various different teams. It gives both management as well as those outside stakeholders a reasonable assurance that you are making that right approach. All right, great answer. Hey guys. I, hey guys, I have to take the next. Excuse me, I want to ask the next question because it's from Steve Miller. For those of you rock and roll fans, 1976, "Fly Like an Eagle" album, great album. And this Steve Miller is asking a question about the value of the business side in security. Um, what's the value of bringing these guys into this process, even though they may have limited IT backgrounds? Well, this is oh, I didn't get a chance to answer that one, so um, I'll, I'll go ahead and take this one real quick, and then hopefully I'll give, give, leave enough time for Bob. Um, the only reason why security operations, incident response, any of this actually exists is to help to protect the business. If you don't understand that, you can't help the business. <laughs> right? You're not providing a return. You're providing loss prevention. Make sure that you're providing the right form of loss prevention, the most effective thing that you can. Totally agree with that, and then it's also managing expectations. You know, what are the you know the balancing act between securing those things versus the potential impact on business when they become an active stakeholder and feel that they're involved in the decision making process versus a security organization just saying we're going to lock this down versus a balanced you know response capability and assuming and both understand the risks that are being assumed if you open up certain capabilities. That is a much better place that now you have an advocate in the business um, group and that you're jointly explaining to the board of directors, to those overseers, that you're saying we have jointly made this decision and presenting it as a team um, is a much stronger position to be in than versus the CISO or the CIO being the one saying I made this decision alone. Okay, great points guys. So I want to, we're, we're right up against the end. We're going to have one last question for you guys, and I need responses in 30 seconds or less. But Heather Berlin had asked a question, will these slides be available offline? You bet you, Heather. And then in addition, we have a really cool white paper, if we can go to the next page on that, just to show that, Paul, that I would encourage everybody to go to the instructions that they give you to take a look. So the last question, quick, 30 seconds max, what type of metrics should you include in reports to management? I want to start, Bob, with you, then to Fraser, and finish with Chris. Let's go. First of all, I would say, you know, what is the speed of effectiveness in terms of incident response? And metrics for uh, success versus uh, failure of attacks, false positives, and, and general uh, incident frequency and volume. Okay, I have a couple. Time to detection, number one. Um, number two, the cost of an incident. And number three, the preventability of any given incident. And I like this preventability in three tiers. 
it was, we have the technology, we could have prevented it, we have the technology, but our business processes or systems make it hard to prevent it, and finally, this was zero day, some other thing that, you know, we really don't have the technology to actually have stopped. Thanks, folks. Um, hey, Leslie Lambert, I know you. Thanks for the question about um, the white paper link, and yeah, we're going to make that available. And I give you my own spin on what side of metrics to report to management, and I can't emphasize enough know what are your most strategic assets, your most critical business process, and know how your firm makes money. And that's what senior management is going to care about. They're not, sometimes they're going to get lost in all these mumbo jumbo technology terms, but tie it into things they care about, risk, value creation. So listen, panelists, you guys were rock stars. And we even had a rock star, Steve Miller, ask a question, which I think is awesome. Um, but I really appreciate your time. Everybody out there who is asking questions, awesome questions, thank you. And let me uh, pass the ball back to Carol from the Sands Institute, who is going to close this thing out. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jim, Chris, Bob, and Fraser, for your great presentation and to D3 Security and the Chertoff Group for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.